All right, the vocabulary word for this episode is handlers. Handlers are the managers of the gang stalking units and subunits. A handler oversees the campaigns, directs the street teams, and passes the information on to his or her own handler. Okay, we're ready to go. TIs, it's time to know thy enemy. things that is often said is that something like this can't remain a secret. Someone would have said something about it already. In some people's minds, since no one has spoken out about it, they won't believe that it is happening. They are absolutely correct that something like this can't be kept a secret long. People would have spoken out about it by now. However, they seem to ignore the TIs who have spoken out about this and seek assistance. Aren't the TIs someone? There have been reports and books written about gang stalking, but yet these people keep saying that someone would have said or done something by now while ignoring all the someones who have. Besides not enough investigations being done, the way the gang stalking units are organized may also help keep the activity an open secret. How are these gang stalking units made up? How do they get new recruits? Based on what is known so far, it is possible that the units are made up the same way that the special agent forces are. I'm not saying that these stalkers are special agents of any sort, just that the units could be created under the same protocol. Let's elaborate. The following comes from Agent Handling by Wikipedia. In intelligence organizations, agent handling is the management of agents, principal agents, and agent networks by intelligence officers, typically known as case officers. A primary purpose of intelligence organizations is to penetrate a target with a human agent or a network of human agents. Such agents can either infiltrate the target or be recruited in place. Case officers are professionally trained employees of intelligence organizations that manage human agents and human agent networks. Sometimes, agent handling is done indirectly through principal agents that serve as proxies for case officers. It is not uncommon, for example, for a case officer to manage a number of principal agents who in turn handle agent networks, which are preferably organized in a cellular fashion. In such a case, the principal agent can serve as a cutout for the case officer, buffering him or her from direct contact with the agent network. Utilizing a principal agent as a cutout and ensuring that a human agent network is organized in a cellular fashion can provide some protection for other agents in the network as well as for the principal agent and for the case officer in the event that an agent in the network is compromised. Assuming that standard principles of intelligence tradecraft have been strictly observed by the principal agent and the agents in the network, compromised agents will not be able to identify the case officer nor the other members of the network. Ideally, agents may work side by side in the same office and conduct their clandestine collection activities with such discipline that they will not realize that they are both members of the same network. Since an agent can sometimes identify his or her principal agent or reveal information under interrogation that can lead to the identification of a principal agent, the protection provided by cellular network organization can be time sensitive. 
If principles of intelligence tradecraft have not been strictly observed, it is also possible that compromised agents can reveal information that exposes other members of the network. In the real world of espionage, human lapses are very much the norm and violations of the principle of tradecraft are common. It is for this reason that agents are ideally trained to resist interrogation for a defined period of time. If an agent is able to resist interrogation for a defined period of time, the odds that other members of the network can be alerted to the compromise improve. A case officer is an intelligence officer who is a trained specialist in the management of agents and agent networks. Case officers manage human agents and human intelligence networks. Case officers spot potential agents, they recruit prospective agents, and they train agents in tradecraft. Case officers emphasize those elements of tradecraft which enable the agent to acquire needed information as well as to enable the case officer to communicate with and supervise the agent. Basically, the units are set up in a way that information is delivered on a need-to-know basis for those who are authorized to know that is. It is possible that perps in one unit may not know perps in another unit, although they may be working on the same campaign. However, the common prompts used in conjunction with other giveaways can allow perps to identify each other. It's nothing new. Here's an example. Two franchise owners are on a business trip to secretly promote their franchise's new products using different marketing strategies. Neither knows the other owns the same franchise and is promoting the same product unless they actually tell each other or one uses a familiar sales pitch taught during training. Unlike conventional business practices, new gang stalking recruits probably don't get orientation meetings where the organization's history, founders, missions, and values are discussed. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can everyone please settle down? It's time to start. Settle down. First, let me say, welcome new recruits. I will be your orientation leader today. Before we go into our network's history and tell you a bit about our founders, let's discuss our mission statement. Our mission statement is, we are in the business of destroying people's lives. We will do our best to terrorize everyone chosen for a campaign and those who don't do what we want. Pretty simple, huh? You have been specially selected to help us achieve our goals because you have the characteristics that fit our network's culture. You're cold-blooded, ruthless, and conniving. You are among the select few who don't care if innocent people get hurt just as long as you get what you want out of this. Again, welcome. We promise to look out for you as long as you remain useful to us. Any questions? No? Good. Here's a video about our network's history. Agents, spotting, and recruitment. By definition, an agent acts on behalf of another, whether another individual, an organization, or a foreign government. Agents can be considered either witting or unwitting, and in some cases, willing or unwilling. Agents typically work under the direction of a principal agent or a case officer. When agents work alone and are not members of an agent network, they are termed singletons. The identification of potential agents is termed agent spotting. 
identifying potential agents and investigating the details of their personal and professional lives involved the granular verification of their bona fides. Such activities can include uncovering personal details that leave potential agents vulnerable to coercion, blackmail, and other inducements such as sexual approaches. The recruitment of potential agents is an art form and it is the raison d'etre of the intelligence case officer. Approaches to potential agents can be multitudinous and interminable, and considerable time can pass before the potential agent is suborned or maneuvered into a position where a recruitment pitch can be hazarded. In the beginning, I said no one is safe from being a target, not even a gang stalker. A reason why there have not been many gang stalking whistleblowers is probably because they are subjected to the same scrutiny as the TIs. Recruiting someone is a delicate issue because of the secret nature of this crime, so the case officer has to be certain that the person will say yes by testing the waters and digging up a lot of dirt about the new recruit's life. It doesn't seem as if this is something someone can just get in and out of easily. Since the activities have to remain secret, but the necessary workforce is large, some unwilling or unknowing participants are used. This supply usually comes from the general public, including the TI's friends and family. Although some of the people close to the TI may have an idea of what is happening. The gang stalkers will mislead the general public into participating in a campaign. That's one of the things that gives the illusion of omnipresence or make the unit seem bigger than it really is. It's a fragile system that depends on secrecy for its survival. During the last episode, we talked about gang stalkers' similarities to flash mobs, with the main difference being that flash mobs were intended to be good, clean fun, while gang stalking is social terrorism. In an interesting turn of events, the London riots has highlighted how social networks can have a Jekyll and Hyde characteristic. The following comes from how the London riots showed us two sides of social networking by Peter Bright. Twitter, tool of collective action. Social networking sites have become standard tools in the arsenal of those organizing all kinds of mass action. They offer instant communications and easy ways for groups of like-minded individuals to come together. Systems such as Twitter's hashtags make it easy for ad hoc networks to form around a common interest, act together, and then disband. In London, police officers were quick to blame Twitter and social networking sites for the organized criminality that has struck across the capital. The move was almost reflexive. Twitter's role in such events is now well known and expected. Twitter was certainly heavily used during the riots, with Monday setting a record for UK visits to the sites. However, although rioters did tweet and continue to tweet, about their acts of theft and vandalism, the blame has now shifted from Twitter to BlackBerry Messenger, BBM. Rioters appear to have been setting their BBM statuses to tell their friends that they were out looting and messaging each other to decide the best places to attack. BBM might at first seem a strange choice. 
RIM's core audience for the BlackBerry is enterprise users, and the rioters are primarily, though not exclusively, disaffected teenagers and young adults. But BlackBerry Messenger has a very compelling feature. It's cheap. Though RIM would insist that its BlackBerry are smartphones, many of them sell at feature phone prices, putting them within reach of many people who can't afford proper smartphones. Blackberries are also readily available on pay-as-you-go plans, further broadening their availability. BBM can also be cheap to use with unlimited BlackBerry Mail and Messenger, typically costing about £5 or around $8 a month, less than most data plans or unlimited text packages. BlackBerry Messenger has another desirable feature. It's a closed system. Unlike Twitter, where tweets are public broadcast, or Facebook, where most messages are shared fairly indiscriminately, BBM is private. Most BBM messages are point-to-point, -point, seen only by the sender and the receiver. Group messages are also possible. These two are only visible to those sending or receiving them. The entire system is also encrypted, offering less scope for surveillance by the police. Unlike protesters campaigning for freedom and openness for whom public visibility was important, Privacy is a desirable characteristic for those engaged in criminality. I am not making any comments on the riots or rioters. I just want to focus on the social networking tools that were used. Also, there is no comment on whether the blame lies with Twitter or any other social networking site. The end user is responsible for how they use these sites, although public should be aware that some people may use these sites to do harmful things, as in the case of gang stalking. One of the questions that may have come to mind was how gang stalkers have kept their activities so secret if they are using Twitter or Facebook. This news report gives a clue into how some gang stalking units are able to send messages under the radar. The article stated that BlackBerry Messenger has another desirable feature, it's a closed system. Unlike Twitter, where tweets are public broadcast, or Facebook, where most messages are shared fairly indiscriminately, BBM is private. Most BBM messages are point-to-point, -point, seen only by the sender and the receiver. Group messages are also possible. These two are only visible to those sending or receiving them. The entire system is also encrypted, offering less scope for surveillance by the police. This could be one inexpensive way that some of the gang stalking units prevent detection. BBM may offer less scope for surveillance, but the article goes on to reveal that police surveillance is still possible. Now it's a bit clearer how new recruits are gathered and what technologies might be used to make it harder to crack into the units. The article did mention that although the new technology and social networks were used to facilitate the damaging activities, it also immediately facilitated the efforts to stop and prevent the same activities. So you're forced into a system of unwanted pursuit? Here's a survival tip. One of the hardest parts of the campaign is betrayal by friends and family. In an effort to isolate and break down the TI, gang stalkers tried to turn those close to the TI against the TI. It's not certain how this is done, but it definitely happens. Here is one TI story of betrayal. I don't even know where to begin. I was speaking to my cousin one day and her voice sounded far away. 
I asked her if her phone was working properly because there was a delay and her voice sounded funny. She told me that it was always like that. I didn't think much of it. Then I asked her what she did all day and she started to get defensive. I didn't think much of it and joked about her response. She continued to get agitated and asked me why I wanted to know, talked about someone who betrayed her and how she will seek revenge if anyone tries to hurt her. She was acting strange and angry. I didn't know where this was coming from since there was really no reason for her behavior. I excused it, thinking that maybe she was under a lot of stress. But a few days later, I sent her several emails and she didn't respond. This wasn't like her. We haven't spoken since and I didn't know why. I put it out of my mind and figured it would work itself out. Then there was the girl I also called cousin. Our parents used to be friends, and we knew the same people. Yet, she actually participated in the campaign. So did her mother. She used the prompts and damaged my things when I stayed with her. Her mother knew I was trying to seek help from a certain person, and actually went and said negative things about me to that person. Then they boasted about their connection to that person, almost as a taunt. I watched them joyfully participate in the campaign, but I did not fight or argue with them. That's what they wanted. It was both of them, her toddler, and me in the apartment. I knew that they wanted a reason to call the cops kick me out or tell people I was crazy. They used the same techniques that the gang stalkers used to try to agitate me. One day, I returned to their home and found my suitcase ripped. I didn't say anything about it. A few days later, the handle on the same suitcase was broken. I asked her about it and she said that she didn't know anything about it. She told me that her mom was usually in that area of the apartment, but why would her mom break my suitcase? Then she said that it must have been her one and a half year old son. There was no way a toddler could have done that kind of damage. I've seen him in action and he couldn't do that. Sadly, she frequently used her child in the campaign. She taught him to call me auntie, but also showed him the prompts and told him to do it to me. Little kids are not good at being discreet, so it was obvious what was going on. The prompts she taught him were just the simple ones. I felt sorry for the little boy for having a mother like that. What kind of sick parent would actually use their child to drive someone to violence? Did she really care about him? Why would she jeopardize his safety like that? It was nauseating to watch her get as happy when her child used the prompts as she did when he could count to 11 on his own. Her mother's actions were equally as sickening. She acted as if she was such a godly, mature, and honorable woman. Yet, what she did was shameful and immature. She talked about how bad and evil others were while she was actively trying to destroy the life of her old friend's child who never did anything to her. Their part in the campaign was to get me homeless. They did so proudly and seemed to laugh at the prospect of me living on the streets. 
These are people who I never had any issues with and defended when I could. Another person I knew from childhood was just as bad. I considered her an aunt and she even had her kids call me their cousin. But she too participated in the campaign, as did her kids and other family members. It was sad to see them come in, use the prompts, and laugh about it. She even invited me to events where other gang stalkers could harass me. She got away with it twice because I didn't know that she would participate in the campaign. But after that, I knew better. She and the other female even tried to drag my family members into it. How could they be so cruel? They behaved as if we were arch enemies. I had tried to talk openly to both of them about what was going on without saying it was gang stalking, but they did not want to talk about it. They avoided the issue or used the prompts. It was a strange experience. They probably thought that using the kids in the campaign was effective. But it was not. It actually helped desensitize me to the prompts. Seeing kids do it proved the immaturity of the whole thing. When the parents used it, it made it easier to see that they were really just little kids in grown up bodies. It was easy to see how immature they were and the prompts were less agitating. Both of the females and the grandma thought they were smart by using the kids, but soon the prompts just reminded me of babysitting. Of course, I didn't lose sight that the parents could pass for adults and were ruthless, but when they arrogantly tried to use the prompts along with intimidation, it just fizzled. I just feel sorry for the kids. Kids know when they are doing something wrong, even if their parents say it isn't. The kids' participation reveals their severely dysfunctional home life. It shows that they come from a family that is not respectful or respectable. This may sound harsh, but I'm just pointing out what the kids' behavior shows. What's harsh is a parent using their kids to destroy an innocent person's life. I came from a dysfunctional home, but my parent never got me involved in her problems. She wanted better for me and always told me to learn from her mistakes. I have seen what happens to kids that are raised by parents who command them to get involved in adult affairs so I know that their parents are doing as much damage to their kids as they are trying to do to me. If these types of activities are part of their family affairs, it's no wonder bullying is such a problem in schools. It's cowardly, low down, and just plain disgusting for parents to force their kids into these activities. I didn't think that these people that I have known for so long would betray me like this, and it's still hard to digest. But it's not going to break me. I know the truth about them now, and know to be more cautious in the future. I sometimes feel like I can't trust anyone anymore. 
but realize that I just need to be a better judge of character and not think that someone won't betray me because of seniority or our history together. I was a friend to them, but they weren't friends to me. I was loyal and faithful to them, but they wouldn't do the same for me. I was throwing my pearls to swine. It was a difficult experience, but it made me wiser. It's disturbing to think that parents could use their children in these life-damaging campaigns, but it's not unusual. A great tip in this story is how the TI used the kids' involvement to help desensitize. When kids are used, it takes the edge off because a TI can put the behavior into perspective. So when the little gang stalkers are using the prompts, a TI can focus on the fact that it's a kid and as an adult, the TI will have the upper hand. It's easy to spot when a kid is misbehaving or being disrespectful. If this is pointed out, the child's parent is expected to correct their behavior. A parent who doesn't will be seen as a bad parent. Now, if the child is using the cough, whistle, or no lip prompts, then it may be best to quietly use this to desensitize to those prompts, but note it as a gang stalking incident. The gang stalkers are also using the kids to try to make it harder for the TI to report what's really happening. For example, a perp parent will try to make the TI look crazy if the TI claims that the kid is involved in gang stalking because the kid keeps coughing. The perp will blame the cough on something harmless. But if it's the middle of summer, then it seems strange for all those kids and adults to be coughing like it's flu season. There is something wrong with a parent who forces their child to do their dirty work. In their quest to break down the TI's self-image, the gang stalkers are sending the message, even our kids won't respect you. Okay, but their kid's behavior is reflective on them, not the TI. The problem is not that the kids are raised in dysfunctional homes. Some decent people came from dysfunctional homes. The problem is that the perp's kids are raised in dysfunctional homes where the dysfunction is glorified, idolized, promoted, and or perpetuated. In the perp's inner circle, it is probably acceptable for kids to go around trying to intimidate and provoke innocent adults, but they know that is frowned upon by the majority. That's why they have to do it covertly. Even if a TI has been highly sensitized to the prompts and has been agitated by the use of kids in the campaign, it is still possible to start using the kids' involvement to desensitize. Listen to the previous TI's account again to help figure out some ways. In TI News, I will present a report about a mother who teamed up with her daughter to cyberbully her neighbor's daughter. She was friends with the girl's parents, but her actions drove the girl to commit suicide. In the case of former friends being capable of life-threatening and or life-damaging betrayal, another report about a whistleblower cop whose former colleagues stalked him and tried to lock him up in a psych ward will be presented. Right now, let's get some tips on how to deal with betrayal. The following comes from Betrayal. When Someone You Love Betrays You by Crystal Kuhn. It is bad enough when a stranger or foe betrays you, but when it is someone you believed to be a close and trusted friend, partner, or spouse, it is especially hurtful. It might feel like you were taken advantage of, deceived, humiliated, despised, cheated, or stabbed in the back. Oftentimes, it comes as a surprise. That is why it is so painful. You would not expect to be hurt so badly from someone you thought you could trust. So, you are left in disbelief 
and unbelievable pain. Anyone who has experienced betrayal in a relationship knows how difficult it is to recover from such an experience. The person you thought you could trust and count on is no longer the person you believe them to be. So you wonder what happened. Were you just wrong about them all along or did something change? Maybe your relationship changed and so did their loyalty to you. Maybe something in either or both of your lives has changed and they became insensitive to you. Or maybe you both grew apart and in different directions. There are many reasons that cause people to betray one another. Sometimes they are very deliberate and intended to hurt the other person. And sometimes they are consequences of choices that are made with no intention of doing any harm to anyone. Looking out for one's best interest can cause some people to disregard relationships they once valued. They may feel the relationship is in the way or not as important anymore. Feelings change. And as the feelings change, so do one's actions and choices. An individual that feels their needs are not being met in a relationship might feel that the relationship is no longer important or worth investing in. Therefore, they might seek to get their needs met elsewhere. This changes the relationship. Eventually, it grows apart and opportunities for betrayal emerge. Betrayal is a destructive force that leaves many ruins in its path. Betrayal changes everything. Relationships and all those affected will never be the same again. The damage done can be irreparable. Trust is lost. Wounds run deep. Anger persists. Hearts are broken. Self-protective walls are erected. Pain is long and lasting. And we wonder, can trust ever be restored? Do wounds ever heal? Will anger cease to exist? Can hearts be repaired? Will the self-protective walls ever come down? Does the pain ever go away? Not only does betrayal change relationships, it changes individuals. Something happens inside of them. They might find it difficult to ever trust again. They might be more guarded and protective of themselves for fear of being vulnerable again. They might learn to be more discerning and less naive. Their expectations of others may change. They may reflect on their own role and responsibility in the relationship and what went wrong. They might try to understand, empathize, and forgive. They may be motivated to grow from the experience and learn more about themselves and others. The pain of betrayal is very real and has a significant impact on the lives of all those who have experienced it. It is one of those painful life experiences that have the power to change people's hearts and lives forever. 
If you have ever been betrayed, you cannot change what has happened to you or make the pain go away. You need time to grieve and feel angry. You need time to be comforted and encouraged. You also need time to restore your faith in yourself and others. Betrayal hurts, and there is no fast and easy way to heal from its effects. It takes more than time. It takes a heart that will not harden. It takes a commitment to believe in others again. Relationships do change as a result of betrayal, but ultimately, how it changes you is what matters most. The following comes from Betrayal of Trust by Dr. Mary Grisham. A break in trust first causes us to doubt our own abilities and perceptions. If we trusted and it did not work out, then what is wrong with our own ability to see reality and size up situations? How can we trust ourselves or another again? We go through a period of doubt and questioning that can be quite profound. Emotional response can run the gamut of anger, panic, grief, hurt, and shock. Our response depends on many things. How important the relationship is to us. Whether we felt there was malicious intent behind the action. If we have experienced other significant betrayals in our lives. How much we self-attack and berate ourselves instead of taking this as a learning experience. Many times we need to decide whether to try to repair this break or cut our losses and leave. Much of this decision depends on our perception of the depth of the betrayal and the intention of the other. Sometimes when processed, the betrayal can be seen as a miscommunication in expectations. Other times it will be viewed as deeper than that. The attitude of the party who let you down is very significant as well. Does the other seem to acknowledge the problem or just become defensive? Do they take ownership and responsibility for their actions? Do they care how you feel? If you want to repair a break in trust, you may wish to ask for the following actions of the other take responsibility for their part in the trouble, understand your feelings, change course and maintain it over time, issue a genuine apology and exhibit remorse. The article said that if you want to repair a break in trust, you may wish to ask for the last four actions. If you have to ask for those actions, then trust can't be repaired. The rest of the article is great, but I just wanted to point out that when betrayal occurs, it is difficult enough trying to figure out if the betrayer's remorse, apology, and promise to improve is sincere. If you have to ask or even consider asking the betrayer for remorse, apology, and or improvement, then you are wasting time that could be spent on worthwhile and satisfying interactions. The following comes from Betrayal of Trust, How to Let Go and Move On When Someone You Trusted Burns You Bad by Mike Hardcastle. 
Know that things can never go back to the way they once were. And keep your eyes wide open for future betrayals. The sad reality is that once trust has been damaged, it can't simply go back to the way it once was, no matter how much both parties may want it to. People who do not value trust enough to respect it in the first place more often than not continue that pattern in the future. This doesn't mean that it is a waste of time trying to rebuild trust. It just means that the new trust has to be different. Call it a more mature trust. While trusting a person who has hurt you isn't impossible, it will never be the same kind of wide-eyed trust we give to people when we first let them in. This is not really a bad thing, even though it may seem like a loss. Seeing people for who they really are, rather than through rose-colored lenses, can be a healthy thing. So, when you decide to try to give trust a second chance, just know that you will be more sensitive to the prospect of another betrayal and forgive yourself if doubt seeps in without real reason. If a TI thinks that those who are close and trusted may be participating in the campaign, don't confront or try to get the person back on your side right away. Chances are they will continue betraying you and may use this as a chance to get you to react the way that the gang stalkers want. It may be hard, but you have to consider those who betrayed you as perps and treat them as such. If they are participating in the campaign, they probably are not doting on the good times you shared. Don't beg or plead with them. At this point, they will only take advantage of you. Try to get out of there and away from them as soon as possible. Try not to let your emotions take over. Don't let them push your buttons. Remember to treat them as perps now. You can't just get into an argument with them and work it out later when you both calm down like old times. The relationship has changed and for your own safety, you must admit that. You don't have to accept it right away, but admit it quickly and keep a safe distance. Most likely, they will use the things you say and or do against you. Too many TIs have learned that the hard way when they find those close to them supporting the effort to have them committed, arrested, or provoking them to violence. The betrayer may or may not change their position later, but as for now, just protect yourself. The betrayer has to make the decision to improve. However, that would mean completely admitting and accepting responsibility for their betrayal. Unfortunately, some betrayers may have difficulty admitting and taking responsibility for betrayals. You can't do that for them. They have to do it for themselves. When dealing with betrayal, the victim may be pressured to forgive. The idea is that forgiving will help the pain go away faster. If the offender is pressuring you to forgive quickly, it is probably to ease his or her own conscience and get things back to the way they were. But does the victim really want things to go back to the way they were? Because the way things were was that the victim trusted the offender who comfortably betrayed while pretending to be true. Ignorance is bliss to those who benefit from it. The only person benefiting from the victim's ignorance is the offender who gets to do his or her dirt in peace while the victim had to suppress the discomforting sense that something was wrong. So forgive when you are ready. If you do it too quickly, then you are betraying yourself. Forgiving quickly is not what is going to help the victim heal. While finding ways to heal, a TI should consider completely admitting to the betrayal, holding the betrayer accountable, embracing the uncomfortable feelings caused by the betrayal, and expressing those feelings effectively and thoroughly in some way that will help the TI heal and eventually sincerely forgive. 
Although the betrayals are real, keep in mind that they are also part of the campaign's goal to break the TI down. TIs may have to endure life-threatening and life-damaging betrayal, so it's completely understandable if they aren't forgiving right off the bat. It is important that a TI remembers to effectively manage the anger that comes with the betrayal so that it can't be used in cumulative anger tactics. Try it and send your feedback to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. Now it's time for FYI, essential information for TIs. Everyone should choose their friends wisely, but a TI must be extra cautious about who they consider a friend. Currently, there is no foolproof method of telling if someone is or will be a true friend. However, there are ways that can help you make more careful choices. You're about to receive some information on how to handle that right now. The following comes from When Friendship Hurts. How to Deal with Friends Who Betray, Abandon, or Wound You by Dr. Jan Yeager. There is no crystal ball to predict that a particular friend will turn out to be a reliable, positive relationship in your life or by contrast that a negative association will cause you emotional distress or worse. Since destructive or negative friends are not always that easy to spot, being forewarned is forearmed, as the saying goes. Some friends may be betrayers from the start. Others may turn into betrayers because of what's going on in their lives or because of changes in their personality. Sometimes you need to consider what your friend is really like within the context of all the behaviors. I can't emphasize enough that you need to consider the root cause. Here, excerpted from chapter 2 in When Friendship Hurts are six traits to consider that could pose a problem in friendship. You may even recognize yourself in one or more of these types. 1. The Promise Breaker This friend constantly disappoints you or break promises, most likely because she herself was constantly disappointed during her formative years. Your friend is unable to stop herself from repeating that pattern. It is an annoying but comfortable pattern for your friend and without psychological help it may be hard for her or him to alter this pattern. You could abandon the friend and the friendship or you could find a way to detach yourself by lowering your expectations for this friendship. If she promises to do something for you even to meet you for a cup of coffee, you can say, sure, but protect yourself by knowing in the back of your mind that this friend, nine times out of ten, is going to cancel on you. Although your friend may always have been this way, she may have also recently acquired this trait because of something she is going through right now. If a friend who has always been there for you through thick and thin has only recently become less reliable, you might want to cut her some slack. You have to decide if this is a lifelong trait that will be hard or impossible to change, a temporary condition that will be short-lived, or something if it does continue indefinitely that you are willing to accept and handle. One way to try to change the promise breaker is to help her to understand the consequences of your ignored pledges. Perhaps you have been keeping your disappointments about this to yourself. Try telling her how it makes you feel of course I understand that you're not in the mood to drive over, but I was really looking forward to our visit. 
Perhaps she is unaware that this is a pattern rather than an isolated incident. Yes, of course I understand, but do you realize this is the fourth time in as many weeks that you have backed out on something you promised to do with me? If you want to continue your friendship with the Promise Breaker, make sure you reconfirm any plans at least once or even right before you are supposed to meet. If you have a cell phone or a beeper, make sure your friend is able to contact you so at least you won't be left waiting if, once again, she cancels a meeting. Have a backup for any promise your friend makes. At least if the promise breaker disappoints you again, you won't be as inconvenienced by it. The next time she promises something, try saying, yeah, right. When she gets angry at your sarcasm, explain that you are simply pointing out her habit of breaking her promises. Then reframe it in a more positive vein by saying, prove me wrong. This time, keep your promise. Once a TI is aware of the campaign, the first thing most want to do is rally support and tell a close friend. But a TI must realize that the campaign may have been going on for a while and gang stalkers generally use more obvious tactics to make the TI aware of the campaign when they think that they've got the upper hand. This could mean that certain people close to the TI have been enlisted. When a TI becomes aware of the campaign, she or he should try to list the people who may be supportive and then try to identify whether those people would betray them or participate in the campaign. A promise breaker is likely to betray the TI. 2. The Double Crosser This negative friend betrays you big time. It could happen when someone does something to hurt you, such as spreading a malicious rumor about you. Or it could be an emotional double cross. For example, when a close or best friend stops speaking to you and you never find out why. That's what happened to Jill, who is now 47. Although angry words were never exchanged between Jill and her friend, the silence, the betrayal of their commitment to be friends and to share was just as real as any harmful action. Jill explains, She was the only real friend I ever had. I didn't make friends easily. I wasn't allowed to have friends. When I got to high school, I met Dale and we became very close. The one time I ran away, I ran to her house. It was a very special friendship. We went to nursing school together. Then one day, she met another girl. About a week later, she stopped speaking to me. I'd call her, she'd hang up on me. I'd write to her, she'd return the letters unopened. Ten years later, they resumed their friendship, although they still have never discussed why Dale stopped calling. The wounds from her friend's emotional double cross are there, however. We're close friends, but not as close. Jill explains, but then she qualifies her description of her friendship with Dale as close. For me, for the type of person I am, it's close. For somebody like my sister, it's not close. The double cross could be something even more concrete, like the betrayal experienced by 43-year-old Susan. 
a homemaker. Susan was betrayed by a married close family friend who was attracted to her sister. He continued to express his desire and love for her, and when she insisted that he put an end to the numerous phone messages at her office, and she told him of her disgust at this attitude, he turned around and told his wife that my sister was coming on to him. It was a real fatal attraction. I personally phoned him and ended our friendship. I'm talking real betrayal. Our family felt totally betrayed by this man whom we had all known since childhood. Susan shares other betrayals by another friend. One of my girlfriends is now using my sister and myself as an alibi while she carries on extramarital affairs. This is very upsetting. She has also repeated some things to another friend which were said to her in confidence. This second friend is putting Susan in a compromising position and possibly even an ethical bind over the cover-up of her extramarital affairs. By blabbing privileged information, she is also acting like the discloser. The double-crosser may have some real emotional issues that need to be addressed if you are to continue a friendship with her. If your friend was betrayed by a parent or sibling during her formative years, she may have a need to repeat that behavior with her friends. The betrayal could have been as subtle as being disappointed by her parents or as blatant as being the victim of emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. Your friend may need outside help to reverse the cycle she is in of doing to others what was done to her. If you have been double-crossed by a particular friend, you may want to consider ending the friendship. If you have not been directly harmed by this friend, but have evidence that she has hurt others, you have to decide if you are risking too much by maintaining the friendship. If you decide to walk away from this friendship, do it in a low-key way that avoids incurring the wrath of the double-crosser. You do not want to be her or his next victim. It's obvious that the double-crosser would betray the TI almost instantly. Figure out who the double-crossers are and take the proper precaution. If a TI had been in communication with the double crosser before becoming aware of the campaign, she or he should review all interactions and what was said to the double crosser because that information was probably passed on to the gang stalkers. Three, the self-absorbed. Certainly, the self-absorbed is a tamer type of negative friend than the risk taker. Still, especially over the long haul, a friend who does not make the time to listen to you will eat away at your self-esteem. For you to feel good about yourself and for your friendship to thrive, you have to be more than a sounding board. The self-absorbed does not care. She listens to you only because she is waiting to speak. Self-absorbed chatter is a way of covering up an inability to tolerate silence, which some, especially those who have intimacy problems, may find excruciating. You may ask your friend to try to become more aware that she is talking non-stop and about herself when it's really a nervous habit designed to fill up the time and space. Could your friend learn to relax more, enjoy silence, 
learn how to ask questions so that you don't feel like a dumping ground. Once again, is this a trait your friend is aware of and choosing to ignore? Or is she unaware of it, but once aware of it, she will be capable of changing it? If change is not possible, is there enough that is positive about this friendship that you are willing to continue it even if it is decidedly lopsided? Perhaps in a gentle and non-offensive way, you can ask the self-absorbed friend if she seems to notice that the give and take is unequal, that she shares more about her life than you get to share about yours. With the self-absorbed friend, you might want to plan an activity to share that minimizes this problem, such as playing tennis going to the movies, or taking a class. You might want to carefully consider sitting next to the self-absorbed on a five-hour train ride or having lengthy meals together, just the two of you. As with the one-upper, whose profile revolves around excessive jealousy, involving more friends with the self-absorbed might help to offset her nervousness as well as create some additional air times that will even out the balance of power. The self-absorbed is extremely self-interested which opens up the possibility for betrayal. Whether or not they will participate or betray a TI depends on what's in it for them or if it has a negative consequence on them. For the discloser, when you say to this friend, this is just between us, she nods her head, but unfortunately, that promise will last only as long as it takes her to get to her phone or email. Although there should be an assumption of confidentiality and trust between friends, this friend can't help herself. Telling this person a secret makes her feel vulnerable and uncomfortable. Like the game Hot Potato, she has to pass the hot secret along to someone else in order to relieve the anxiety knowing the secret made her feel. There are also some disclosers who simply have a big mouth. If someone you know has this personality trait, avoid telling her your innermost secret unless you don't mind if it's shared with the world. This friend quickly gets a reputation for being a gossip. Unfortunately, there may be some secondary gains to having that distinction. Maybe the primary friend is annoyed by the betrayal and the secret sharing, but everyone else, including other friends, may be delighted by the confidential information that is being shared. You also have to be sure that your friend understands that you consider the information that you are sharing should always be confidential or secret. Spreading the news that you just got a raise or are expecting a child may seem like information that is fair game for retelling. If it is something you do not want retold, or if you want to be the one retelling it, let your friend know before you mislabel her, the discloser. How do you know if someone will betray your confidence? If you suspect someone has this trait, share an unimportant secret that you could live with her spreading and see how fast or widespread the confidence is shared. If you suspect that your friend is unaware that he or she discloses secrets, start by bringing this behavior out in the open. Pick a specific instance when your friend reveals a confidence and see if he or she acknowledges his or her transgression. Does he or she apologize? Does he or she deny doing it? 
does he or she ask your forgiveness, explaining that he or she was unaware the information was privileged? If you suspect your friend is incapable of changing this pattern and you want to maintain the friendship, protect yourself by being more careful about exactly what information you share. You might also want to reconsider the level of intimacy for this friendship. If you want to maintain your relationship, perhaps it should be on a less frequent or less confidential basis. Perps will use the Discloser's inability to keep a secret to find out a TI's secrets. The Discloser may share the information without knowing about the campaign. There are two things to consider about a Discloser. One is that if this person can't keep a secret, it is possible that the gang stalkers won't let them know about the campaign but just milk information out of them. If she or he can't keep certain information private, then the gang stalkers might try to avoid the possibility that the Discloser will tell you what's going on. The Discloser may know what's going on and decide to give information about you anyway, keeping their involvement a secret because it's their secret. Most people who easily spill other people's secret don't have any problems keeping their own really personal information hidden. What they think should remain private may differ from what other people think. Remember that there may be people who fall into more than one of these categories. For example, if a discloser is also a double-crosser, you know that everything they know about you will be revealed to the gang stalkers and they will be very active in the campaign. Whether or not the discloser will betray you is secondary to you keeping a safe distance and being very careful what private information you share. Five, the competitor. A little bit of competition is healthy and to be expected. An appropriate amount of competition will motivate and stimulate, but too much competition between friends starts to destroy the friendship. One of the primary ingredients in a positive friendship is that one or both friends feel that they can be themselves and that they don't have to put on airs or impress one another. Competition implies a race in which one wins and the other loses. Those conditions are quite the opposite of what someone typically expects in a positive friendship, especially a close or best one. Friends who are competitors probably compete in every area of their lives and find it difficult or impossible to ease up even when it comes to close or best friends. They may compete at work, at school, and even in community affairs. They may be in competition with their spouses or romantic partners, or even with their parents or their children. The competitor may find this distinctive personality trait hard or impossible to change or eradicate. You can help the situation, however, by trying to avoid setting up overly competitive situations. For instance, if you share about a success in your personal life or career, especially if you ease into bragging, you may be unwittingly setting off an I'll show you reaction. Helping to heighten the competitor's awareness about this tendency might help her to deal with this proclivity. If you do want to share something that you think will propel her into a Me Too reaction, you should preface your comment with, Let me just share something with you without it having anything to do with you, okay? The onus for changing the competitor's behavior, however, is on her. Developing a better self-image will diminish her need to compete with everything you say or do.
If you wish to stay friends with the competitor, you may have to be willing to listen to her brags and boasts far more often than you can share your own. If the competitor is really a Brutus, as in, et tu, Brute? A TI better watch out because this person's competitiveness will take over and won't stop until they win or definitely lose. But the competitor will do everything to win. The competitor will fight for the team that he or she chooses. If a person is overly competitive, even when there is no conflict, then there is a high chance for betrayal. This person might want to see you torn down, especially if they believe you are more successful or possess something they feel they lack. Notice that it isn't whether or not you are really more successful or think you are more successful. It's all based on their perception. So although you may feel that your competitive friend is equally or even more successful than you, or that they have other admirable attributes that compensate if they are less successful, it doesn't matter. If they think that you are prettier, smarter, have more money, have better relationships, are more popular, have more confidence, etc., they will try to beat you. Some will participate in the campaign or betray you for those reasons alone. Six. The Fault Finder Nothing you do, say, or wear is good enough for this overly critical friend. The Fault Finder was probably raised by extremely judgmental parents who were also rearing equally hypercritical siblings. Being criticized during her formative years laid the groundwork for an overly critical adult. It's a hard trait to reverse, and your friend may even be unaware that she is so critical or that it annoys and upsets you so much. Before labeling this type of friendship as hopelessly destructive, you might want to see if your friend could recognize this excessively derogatory behavior and with time and help change that orientation. Otherwise, you may decide that you just have to accept this trait in your friend and realize that it reflects on her, not on you or your friendship. If you value this friend and want to try to maintain the friendship despite the fault finder's criticisms, try sharing with him or her how his or her behavior makes you feel. I know you'll like me, and I know you may not even mean to make me feel bad, but when you find fault in everything I say or do, it makes me feel bad about myself. He or she might get defensive, even saying it's your problem, not his or hers. But if you emphasize how the fault finder's behavior impacts on you, it might help him or her to reassess what he or she is saying or doing without having to be right. Furthermore, by sharing how it makes you feel, you may be less resentful if you decide you are willing to put up with the fault finder. However, if you are at your wit's end and willing to try one more thing before calling it wits, try finding fault with the fault finder. Those who criticize and find fault are often unable to take it from others. If you do criticize the fault finder, it may break the spell of negativity that is now allowing this friend to say and do anything toward you. When the shoe is on the other foot, she may suddenly have an aha awareness of what it feels like to others. But beware! The fault finder might cut off your friendship forever rather than deal with your criticisms or even try to understand the larger message you are trying to convey. The fault finder will betray you and find ways to blame you for the whole thing. 
this person may be aware of the campaign and say that you must have done something to deserve it. A TI who discovers that a fault finder has betrayed them shouldn't bother trying to prove to this person that it was a wrong decision. Just keep a safe distance. This book is a really helpful guide for identifying current friendships that have gone wrong and potential friendships that may be harmful. It can also apply to family, colleagues, and associates, even though those may not be classified as friends. The perps often try to enter the TI's life disguised as a potential friend in order to glean more information and cause more damage. Remember that some perps may also have read the book and tried to work around it, but in any case, it can still be helpful for a TI to become aware of the types of friends and use the information to develop their own ways to decrease the chances of befriending perps and non-perp frenemies. A frenemy is a person who pretends to be your good friend but is really your enemy. It's the annoying, competitive, mean, and hateful friends that you tolerate for some strange reason. The book is a good starting point to help not only TIs, but other people become more aware of how their friendships are going and sort out some issues that may be hard to pinpoint. If you have essential tips for TIs, please send them to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats and turn off or mute your cell phones, pagers, and beepers. The show is about to begin. This street theater comes from White Plains, New York. I had a habit of going into a certain store and checking out the hair products. It was a routine that the purse picked up on and started to wait for me in that aisle. Once they sent an old man with barely any hair into the section. It was amusing to see him pretending to look at women's hairsprays while watching me. He gave me the prompt, then quickly walked away. Sheesh, can't a T.I. just shop in peace without having to babysit some perps? I swear, it was like a little kid messing with an adult. These people need to grow up. Speaking of growing up, one day I walked past that hair supply section. One of the perps saw that I didn't go in that aisle like I usually do, but she was so intent on going through with her plans that she called after me. She chased me down and said hi to me. I didn't realize she was a perp yet, but she told me that she was an old friend of mine from childhood. I asked her how she recognized me and she said I looked the same. <laughs> Get this, I was wearing sunglasses and a hat. Plus, I had beelined past the aisle where she was lurking. Furthermore, this chick probably hadn't seen me since high school. There was no way she could have recognized me that quickly. So. I'm thinking, stalker, and I told her that I didn't know who she was. She started to give the prompt while insisting that I knew her. What did she think that was going to do? It didn't make me recognize her as an old friend, but it did make me recognize her as a gang stalker. I repeated that I didn't know her and I walked away before she could embarrass herself anymore. I looked her up and she did look like someone I knew a long time ago. Man, if that was really her, then I am disappointed. The girl she claimed to be wasn't a good friend of mine, but I thought she was better than that. I expected that girl to like become some educated, mature, and successful woman. I expected so much from her. I thought that she would be doing big things, but instead she was chasing down former classmates and wagging her tongue like some rabid dog. What a shame. How does someone drop from being most likely to succeed to being most likely to stop? Now it's time for TI News. I'm always looking for news stories about stalking, especially gang stalking. So if you find a news story that appeared in an official news source, please email it to protectlifenow at yahoo.com. So here's the news for today. This news report comes from Oprah Tears Over Baby and Backstab by Corinne Steinler and Todd Venetia. 
She's a pillar of strength to millions of Americans, but Oprah Winfrey has revealed for the first time how she cried and cried on the dark day when a relative stabbed her in the back and told the world her biggest secret, how she got pregnant and then lost the baby at age 14. Oprah called it the ultimate betrayal when the unnamed family member sold the tale to the National Choir for $19,000 in 1990. She had struggled for years to keep anyone from learning of her teen pregnancy because she was so ashamed. Only my family and closest friends knew, she wrote in this month's issue of her magazine, O. Oh. I would tell no one until I felt safe enough to share my dark past, the years I was sexually abused from age 10 to 14, my resultant promiscuity as a teenager, and finally, at age 14, my becoming pregnant. I was so ashamed I hid the pregnancy until my swollen ankles and belly gave me away. The baby died in the hospital weeks later. Oprah said that after the pregnancy, she feared she would be kicked out of school for being promiscuous. Later, she feared it would hurt her career. I carried the secret into my future, always afraid that if anyone discovered what had happened, they too would expel me from their lives. The timing of the article comes just as Oprah is being criticized for a show on Missouri kidnap victim, Sean Hornbeck. Some experts and critics were upset because Oprah had asked the parents of Hornbeck, a 15-year-old who was held captive for more than four years, whether they thought he was sexually molested, and they said yes. Oprah's new essay is framed to fit the theme of the issue, My First. While some of her celebrity pals mused about their first job or first broken heart, Oprah wrote about her first betrayal. She said that after the story of her teen pregnancy was revealed, she was inconsolable. I took to my bed and cried for three days, she wrote. I felt devastated, wounded, betrayed. How could this person do this to me? I cried and cried, she wrote. I remember Stedman coming into the bedroom that Sunday afternoon. The room was darkened from the closed curtains. Standing before me, looking like he too had shed tears, he handed me the tabloid and said, I'm so sorry, you don't deserve this. Oprah has spoken before about the abuse she suffered in her youth. In 1985, she first told viewers on her show that a 19-year-old cousin raped her when she was nine. He was the first of three family members to sexually molest me, she said at the time. This week's article, however, is the first time Oprah had ever detailed how she felt about getting pregnant as a teen and how she felt about being ratted out by a loved one. Last November, during a show on teen pregnancy, she mentioned her own pregnancy briefly to give a message to her teen guest. My father said to me at that time what I'm going to say to you. What you have done is in the past, and you alone get to determine what your future will be, she said. Writing for O Magazine about her shame, Oprah recalled, I imagined that every person on the street was going to point the finger at me and scream, Pregnant at 14, you wicked girl, expelled. No one said a word though, not strangers, not even people I knew. I was shocked, nobody treated me differently. For 20 years, I had been expecting a reaction that never came, she wrote. And I soon realized that having the secret out was liberating. What I learned for sure was that holding the shame was the greatest burden of all. This isn't a gang stalking case. It's just an article about betrayal by family members. It's an inspiring article to remind TIs that there is life after betrayal from those whom you loved and cared about. Even the amazing Oprah had to face this horrible betrayal at a bad time. A time when her family members should have been supporting and protecting her. But the courageous Oprah was able to weather the storm and it made her stronger in the end. She still thrived and continued her success. That $19,000 doesn't seem so sweet after the betrayal is revealed. The betraying family member lost something more than that money, something that no amount of money could buy back. When someone betrays an innocent person, especially for money or new alliances, they always lose. Two reasons. One, their new alliance is aware of the betrayer's lack of integrity and character. The new alliance won't make the mistake of trying
trusting the person who will probably just use the betrayer. It is unlikely that a solid, true alliance can develop from a connection that starts off like this, because the new alliance must realize that if this person can betray an innocent, trusting friend or family member, it is likely that they too will get betrayed. The second reason is that the betrayer can be bought. The betrayer's loyalty is up for sale and probably has to be maintained at a cost. That's not a friendship even deceivers desire. So, for all the TIs and everyone else that was innocent and betrayed, the betrayers have done the most harm to themselves. You can restore what was lost, especially when the truth comes out, but the betrayers will not be able to restore their self-inflicted damage to their own reputations and character. This news report comes from Adrian Schoolcraft, Answer the Times, Watch the NYPD Sweat, by Len Levitt. The New York Times has joined the Adrian Schoolcraft NYPD in Brookville. By devoting a full column front page story Friday to the whistleblower cop, the Times has legitimized at least the tip of his police corruption charges that until now have appeared in the city's tabloids, The Village Voice, and this column. Although it may appear to hibernate for part of the year, the Times does awaken and then beware. There's nothing more dangerous to a politician or a police commissioner who harbors political ambition. On the surface, the Times' schoolcraft story may seem of minor import, a secretly tape-recorded roll call meeting last April made by what the Times described as a police supervisor that quoted an 81st Precinct captain saying cops have to fulfill traffic quotas or risk being fired. A captain, said the Times, can be heard warning his top commanders that his officers must start writing more summonses or face consequences. He said each officer on a day tour should write 20 summonses a week, five each for double parking, parking at a bus stop, driving without a seatbelt, and driving while using a cell phone. The Times, of course, is only at the outer perimeter of the crime statistic scandal that is roiling the department. What's at stake is more than traffic quotas at one precinct. The Times hinted at the bigger picture. It said the captain cited pressure from top police officials, indicating that the quota system was countenanced, even encouraged from on high. Its story added that the recording makes clear that precinct leaders were focused on raising the number of summonses issued, even as the police department had already begun an inquiry into whether crime statistics in that precinct were being manipulated. Crime statistics being manipulated is the elephant in the room down at one police plaza. Downgrading felonies to misdemeanors to make citywide crime appear lower than it actually is is not confined to the 81st precinct, but appears to be rampant throughout the department. As criminologist and a former NYPD captain wrote recently in the Village Voice, the omnia side is that in order to silence dissenters and deny any problems, the NYPD continues to close its doors to any non-sponsored outside scrutiny, yet the evidence of data manipulation is, at this point, overwhelming. Such downgrading has consequences for public safety that go beyond statistics. As The Voice reported, police in Upper Manhattan downgraded the complaint of rapes to misdemeanor assaults, which meant that the detectives weren't aware that a pervert was on the loose until a half a dozen women were attacked. Frightening in another way was the department's response to Schoolcraft's charges. A police posse led by a deputy burst into Schoolcraft's apartment and dragged him against his will to Jamaica Hospital, where he was kept in a psych ward for six days. Retaliation for his corruption charges, his lawyer maintains. When Schoolcraft subsequently fled the city and moved upstate, the department pursued him, treating him like a fugitive. They repeatedly sent cops hundreds of miles to bang on his door and threaten him with reprisal if he did not return. An official of the local upstate police department confirmed to this reporter that the NYPD had been all over Schoolcraft's place. After remaining silent for a day after the Times ticket quota story, the department spokesman came out with guns blazing, calling the reporting of the world's most respected newspaper confused and absurd. Such name-calling is typical NYPD overkill when the department has been caught red-handed. And what a schoolcraft charge that the department's spokesman, a 
accompanied the police posse that dragged him in handcuffs to the psych ward. So far, the department spokesman, who readers of this column know as Mr. Truth, has refused to officially respond to that question, although he did tell a psychophantic television reporter, off the record, that he wasn't there. So as not to appear confused or absurd, this reporter sent him the following email. Were you or were you not at Smallcraft's apartment when he was brought to Jamaica Hospital? He did not respond. Let's see how he answers when the Times asks. The Chief Queen's Assistant District Attorney called this column's suggestion that his office was reluctant to investigate Adrian Schoolcraft's police-led trip to Jamaica's hospital psych ward a cheap shot. The Chief Queen's Assistant District Attorney pointed out that to begin an investigation into the incident, he needed Schoolcraft's cooperation. He said that he would produce his medical records and he never produced them. If he produces the records, we will look at his allegations. I have read a news report about crooked cops who engage in gang stalking. I also said that not everyone in the criminal administration system is engaged in these activities. This news report highlights that there are good cops and some even try to do what is right. However, T.I. should still be careful when interacting with members of the criminal administration system. The news report also shows that anyone can become a target, how easily people can turn on each other, the attempts to discredit the TIs by forcing them into psych wards, and how gang stalking can be used to silence whistleblowers. The last paragraph also highlights how the victim is blamed. This is a classic trick. If the victim doesn't cooperate, then we can't help him and don't blame us. This is usually said after terrorizing the victim to the point where she or he knows that everything and anything will be used against him or her. Now, some people may say, What are you gonna do, eh? The system is corrupt. This happens everywhere and it happens all the time. All the time? I don't think so. Everywhere? Probably not. However, if anyone who believes this has been everywhere and seen this happen all the time, please share your experience. It's more like this happens sometimes and in some places. There is no argument that it can happen, but does it have to? If it does happen, should it be automatically allowed or ignored? This news story comes from Suicide of Megan Meyer by Wikipedia. Megan Meyer was born in O'Fallon, Missouri. From the third grade, Megan had been under the care of a psychiatrist. She had been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and depression and had self-esteem issues regarding her weight. She was described by her parents as a bubbly, goofy girl who enjoyed spending time with her friends and family. For eighth grade, Meyer's parents enrolled her at a Catholic school with a uniform and policy against makeup and jewelry that the Meyers thought would help Megan fit in. At the time of the incident, the Drew and Meyer household were neighbors living four doors apart. The account through which the bullying of Meyer took place purportedly belonged to a 16-year-old male named Josh Evans. However, Lori Drew, the mother of a former friend of Meyer, later admitted creating the MySpace account with her daughter and Ashley Grills, Lori Drew's 18-year-old employee. Several people contributed to running the faked account, including Drew. Witnesses testified that the woman intended to use Meyer's email with Josh to get information about her and later humiliate her in retribution of her allegedly spreading gossip about Drew's daughter. Soon after opening an account on MySpace, Meyer received a message supposedly from a 16-year-old boy, Josh Evans, but actually sent by Lori Drew using a fabricated account. Meyer and Josh became online friends, but never met in person or spoke. Meyer thought he was attractive. Meyer began to exchange messages with this person and was described by family as having had her spirits lifted. This person claimed to have just moved to the nearby city of O'Fallon and was homeschooled and did not yet have a phone number. On October 15, 2006, the tone of the messages changed with the Drew saying via the account, I don't know if I want to be friends with you anymore because I've heard that you are not very nice to your friends. Similar messages were sent. 
Some of Megan's messages were shared with others and bulletins were posted about her. According to Meyer's father and a neighbor who had discussed the hoax with Drew, the last message sent by the Evans account read, Everybody in Old Fallon knows who you are. You are a bad person and everybody hates you. Have a bad rest of your life. The world will be a better place without you. Meyer responded with a message reading, You're the kind of boy a girl would kill herself over. The last few correspondences were made via AOL Messenger instead of MySpace. She was found 20 minutes later in her bedroom closet. Megan had hung herself. Despite attempts to revive her, she was pronounced dead the following day. Six weeks after her death, Megan Meyer's parents were informed that the mother of one of their daughter's friends, with whom Meyer's had a falling out, had created the Josh Evans account. The parents, Lori Drew, who created the fake accounts, admitted that she and her daughter had the password to the account and characterized the hoax to a reporter as a joke. Initially, Drew denied knowing about the offensive messages that were sent to Meyer. She told the police that the account was aimed at gaining Megan's confidence and finding out what Megan felt about her daughter and other people. The neighborhood mother, who had informed the Myers that Drew had been responsible for the hoax account, said Lori laughed about it and that Drew said she had intended to mess with Megan. While Drew's name was excluded from most early news stories, CNN disclosed her name through the inclusion of the police report in its broadcast of the story, which many blogs then featured. There was a gap of over a year from the time of the suicide until the time of the controversy behind it was finally reported in the media. This was due to a request by the FBI who had been investigating the hoax and had asked the Meyer family not to say anything publicly in order to keep the Drews from finding out about their investigation. Shortly after the first anniversary of Meyer's death, Meyer's aunt saw an article about internet harassment and contacted the writer to share Meyer's story with him. Once the story broke, it quickly spread to national and international news outlets. At a press conference on Monday, December 3rd, 2007, Jack Banas, the prosecuting attorney of St. Charles County, said that Lori Drew's 18-year-old temporary employee, Ashley Girls, wrote most of the messages addressed to Meyer and that she wrote the final Josh Evans message addressed to Meyer. Grills said she wrote the final message to end the MySpace hoax and get Megan Meyer to stop communicating with Josh Evans. Banas said that he did not interview Grills because at the time she was under psychiatric treatment for the involvement in the Meyers case and did not plan to interview her at a later date. The Myers criticized the prosecutor's statements, saying that Banas did not interview any party other than the Drews and that Banas is solely relying on the testimony of the Drews. Banas stated that the original FBI investigation into the matter, at which time Girls was interviewed, established the employee's role in the event. The Myers have said that they do not hold Girls responsible for Megan's death. Bana said the Drew's daughter, now 15, is attending a different school. He said Lori Drew was fearful of telling him where her daughter lives. According to Lori Drew's attorney, she has had to close her advertising business in the wake of the controversy, and the Drews will probably be unable to continue to live in the neighborhood. Neighbors shunned the Drews following the incident. It's disturbing to know that parents would teach or encourage their kids to do these horrible things. In a scene from a made-for-TV movie called Cyberbully, a young man shares his bullying story during group therapy. He said that he trusted someone enough to reveal some personal information, but the person betrayed his trust and told others. The betrayer and his friends also acted out the private information for the young man every time they saw him. This had an eerie resemblance to the gang stalkers street theater. Gang stalking and bullying have so many similarities that it begs the question, did the parents teach the kids how to do these things, or are the parents borrowing from their kids' tactics? It's the chicken or egg conundrum. Could it 
it be that gang stalker parents teach their kids how to bully and harass others? And if the kids are encouraged to do these things to adults whom they are supposed to show respect, imagine how easy it could be to do it to their peers, especially when they know that they will have their parents' approval or even that their parents are engaged in a similar activity. Is this the reason why it seems that parents of victims are running into brick walls or nothing is being done about bullying? On the flip side, can it be that the gang stalker parents borrow their kids' tactics to make the TI's claims seem childish when they try to report it? Or could it be a mixture of both? Once this gang stalking crime is investigated, more can be learned about it and its connections to other things. It seems as if it takes a death, destruction, or some other kind of tragedy to start the process of change towards something better. It doesn't have to be like this. Meyer's death caused people to finally stand up and laws were passed against cyberstalking or cyberbullying. This is good, but there is a better way. Let me explain something about these gang stalkers. Some of these people enjoy being cruel and starting trouble. They brag about how mean and cold-hearted they are. When a target is torn down or dies, most of them take it as an accomplishment. Just another target they can brag about beating and laugh over the sordid details of the campaign. These are incredibly insecure and overly competitive types who have the tendency to think that if they don't tear someone down, put that person in their place, or rip that person a good one, they haven't achieved anything. In their inner circle, that's how they gain clout. If someone is more successful, intelligent, attractive, has a better personality, etc., these people will probably feel insecure around that person. They will go into their inner circle and plan ways to tear the person down or humble them, as they like to call it. The more they can get away with it, the better they will feel about themselves. That is, until the next better person comes along, and there will always be someone who is doing better. They spend most of their energy plotting ways to tear other people down rather than addressing the issues that keep them down and unhappy. They will think that they are smarter or have something over the person because they are doing things to destroy the person without the person's knowledge. Then they may smile in the person's face and call the person stupid for not knowing that all this is happening. The only stupid thing that their victim did was actually mistaking the offender for a decent person. But that can be excused because as you can see in the TI story, even when the victim figures it out, the offenders continue to lie and deny what's going on. These offenders really have a psychotic habit, but most of these types will deny wrongdoing and blame the victim as much as possible. They get off on getting away with it. If they apologize, most of the time it's insincere. They usually aren't sorry it happened, but they are sorry they got caught. So waiting on these offenders to change is what perpetuates the problems. Change occurs when the audience finally stands up, when the bystander finally helps. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be smooth sailing. Too many victims and bystanders think that once they support the change, everything will fall into place by itself. Unfortunately, that is a naive idea that has stopped progress in its tracks. It's time to admit that progressive change isn't a one-time deal. It requires maintenance and practice until it becomes society's good habits. Offenders want to make it seem as if it's easier to live their way, but it also takes a lot of maintenance and practice to maintain a negative environment. It looks effortless because the offenders have been doing this for a while. As you can see from the TI accounts and this news story, some bullies and gang stalkers are born into it. However, the previous accounts and this news story also point out how much effort and vigilance is needed to maintain a sordid campaign. In summary, change begins when the victims and bystanders stand up to the offenders. There's no need to wait for a tragedy. However, progressive change is not a one-time deal. It requires maintenance and practice until it becomes society's good habits. This is mainly because the offenders will be vigilant and extend much effort towards regression. It also takes a lot of energy and vigilance to maintain a regressive environment. In the end, it's up to the victim and bystanders. The bystanders must realize that the offenders give the bystanders two choices, go along with it or 
or do nothing. It doesn't matter which the bystander chooses because both benefit the offender. Both allow the offender to do their dirt in peace with higher chances of getting away with it. If the bystander plays along, she or he wins the offender's favor. That is, until the offender decides otherwise or the bystander does something to upset the offender. It's like constantly walking on eggshells. The bystander can also do nothing. Don't get involved and just hope that they will not become a target or defend their territory just enough to keep the offender away while ignoring the victim's cries for help and the devastation that is occurring right under their noses. I'm not telling anyone to risk their life, health, or safety to help the victims. That's the idea that people get when they think of helping victims in dire circumstances. That's the movies, the great dramatic rescue that ushers in change, the martyrs who sacrifice their own lives to save another. It's endearing, but unfortunately, it makes progress seem suicidal and damn near impossible. Progress isn't always easy, but it isn't always so hard. So there are choices besides do nothing or go along. One other choice is to do something. There are ways that bystanders can help victims and usher in progressive change without life-threatening or life-damaging risks. A famous quote says that all that's necessary for the forces of evil to win in the world is for enough good men to do nothing. It's true. There is more good than bad in the world. That's why humans still exist. But the good are under constant threat by the bad that if they interfere, they will be next. But remember, there are more good people than bad. That's important. The offenders know this, and that's why it takes so much effort to maintain a regressive environment. However, it's also important to remember that the offenders don't fight fair. They don't play by the rules. And if you beat them at their own game, they will tell you you are no different than them. But this isn't true. In an earlier episode, an excerpt was read from Beware the Covert Aggressive Personality, where it was stated that covert aggressives exploit your normal sensitivities, can see anxiousness and other vulnerabilities to manipulate you into succumbing. They need people who are not like them to play fair while they break the rules. Why? Because that's the only way they can guarantee a win against someone whom they probably couldn't beat by playing fair. For example, this plays out in gang stalking through the covert abuse, not letting the TI know who they are, outnumbering the TI, spreading misinformation without the TI's knowledge, and preventing the TI and the audience from direct, open discussion about what the gang stalkers said and did. They also rely on the TI to be good and just take the abuse. If the TI fights back, they actually try to make the TI feel bad and spread more false rumors about the TI to the audience. In other words, offenders exploit the fact that most people have a conscience and would prefer to do what is right. While engaging the offenders, victims and bystanders should also take note that most of us want to believe that everyone is good and wants to be good, but they can't help it. A paragraph in the same excerpt can help explain. What our gut tells us a manipulator is like challenges everything we've been taught to believe about human nature. We've been inundated with a psychology that has us seeing everybody, at least to some degree, as afraid, insecure, or hung up. So while our gut tells us we're dealing with a ruthless survivor, our head tells us they must be really frightened or wounded underneath. What's more, most of us generally hate to think of ourselves as callous and insensitive people. We hesitate to make harsh and seemingly negative judgments about others. We want to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they don't really harbor the malevolent intentions we suspect. We're more apt to doubt and blame ourselves for daring to believe what our guts tells us about our manipulator's character. While from 
a certain perspective, we might say someone engaging in these behaviors is defending their ego from any sense of shame or guilt. It's important to realize that at the same time the aggressor is exhibiting these behaviors, he is not primarily defending or attempting to prevent some internally painful event from occurring, but rather fighting to maintain position, gain power, and to remove any obstacles both internal and external in the way of getting what he wants. Seeing the aggressor as on the defense in any sense is a setup for victimization. Recognizing that they are primarily on the offensive mentally prepares a person for the decisive action they need to take in order to avoid being run over. So if the audience, bystanders, or victim chooses to stand up to the offender, usher and change, don't be naive and think that pleas to the heart or conscience will always work or even that the offender will play by the rules. The offender relies on the victims and bystanders to do these things. There is no need to turn into a cynic. Remember, there are more good people than bad. Just admit that some people enjoy doing harmful things to others. I'm not suggesting that anyone engage in criminal or immoral activities or do something that's not right. I'm pointing out the mistakes that progressive people make and what offenders do to regress or prevent change. It's the things that gives the false impression that things will never change or that no matter how much things change, they will always be the same. Things have changed. Progress has been made and maintained. Learning from mistakes helps victims, the audience, and bystanders figure out ways to usher in and maintain progressive change. That's it for this episode. I'll email protectlifenow at yahoo.com for more information. If any gang stalkers disagree with the information presented, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.